يشرح للمشاهد أبعاد الخبر إلى أي حد Yes, hello. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent then. So we are about to start. Okay. We're going to wait for, for, uh, for people to connect, okay? Right, that's fine. Yeah. Hello, um, hello everybody. We are about to start. We are just waiting for a few more connections before we we officially uh, officially start. So, thank you very much for your connections. Let let's wait for uh, uh, for a few more minutes for latecomer to join. Thanks for your understanding. Hello everybody, we are about to start. We are just uh, granting a few more minutes to late come to join. Thanks for your understanding. We are about to start. Hello, everybody. We we are about to start. We are just granting uh, five more minutes. Five, sorry, five more minutes for latecomer to join. Thanks for your understanding. Dominic, you you can put your camera on. Uh, when uh, just want to to make sure that uh, it works for the introduction. Okay, thank you. It works. Yeah. So we are about to start um, in two in two more minutes. Okay, just waiting for the commerce to join. Thanks.
Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for making yourself uh, available. Um, we are about to start. So, assalamu alaikum, bonjour, uh, dear all. I'm Bokhtar al Faba, the country manager of Invest in Africa in Mauritania, and I'm most pleased and honored to welcome you to this awareness webinar jointly delivered with Invest in Africa Senegal, IBAFAL and team, and facilitated by Dominique Tano, consultant MBA in pro uh, a real, if I can say, a real and strong <coughs> procurement expert with over 20 years experience in public and private sector procurement. He has an extensive knowledge in the application of a number of donor funded and MNC's procurement procedures. The today's session will be an ultimate guide to tender process and management, increased knowledge of written and unwritten rules on procurement function, which plays a strategic role in the success of organizations. This growing awareness of its critical role should enhance the efficiency and effectiveness utilization of companies' financial resources, thereby improving significantly the commitment and the level of professionalism required. To achieve this level, this importance of capacity development as part of the procurement process in the various sectors cannot be overlooked within local SMEs, local African SMEs. What an interesting and much needed 60 minute sensitization session to put the tendering process of the procurement system in context by explaining as a, uh, by explaining the importance of tendering as a key stepping stone to contract awards, which is what we are all looking for to achieve. Invest in Africa is a leading local content and capacity building not-for-profit organization working together in Mauritania and in Senegal to give local SMEs the best possible chance to benefit from foreign investors and industry giants who want to use their local buying power as a force for good. Success for us is about creating sustainable local business that can diversify and create jobs, but none of this is possible without the support from our funding and paying member. I mean BP in Mauritania and Senegal, Efficiency in Senegal, Woodside, uh, sorry, Efficiency in Mauritania, Woodside in, uh, in, in Senegal, to mention a few. Presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Kindly feel free to suggest questions in the chat box. We cannot make and we shall not make any promises to answer all the questions, but we'll do our best to take the most. So excuse us in advance for uh, not being able to take all the questions. Many thanks for joining us. You are, you are numerous and I expect figures to increase uh, during this one hour session. Dominique, the floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Boka. And, uh, I want to welcome everybody from all parts of Africa who are participating in this uh, all important session. So, Buka, I think we can start the slides. Okay, if you can switch, if you can switch up your camera and then we'll start. Thanks for that. Okay, all right. Dominique? Yeah, okay, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I welcome you once again. Um, I'm pleased to have all, all of you here listening to me from all corners of Africa. And uh, I'm also going to give out my best in this very important uh, session. Now, the topic is procurement management, an ultimate guide to tender process and management. I believe that, you know, every private sector in business 
is looking for an opportunity to serve or deliver uh, goods or services or projects to a customer. And for you to do that, you need to go, go through a process to win a contract. Now, the tender process is one of the steps in the procurement process, which is very key. And that is what we are going to focus on. And then at the end of it all, you will all be able to understand the rules governing the tender uh, process across the world. So the objectives of this session are as follows. At the end of it all, participants should be able to understand the structure of a standard tender document. They should be also be able to identify the eligibility and qualification criteria of tenders and then how to apply the rules governing the tender process. You should also be able to complete the tender documents in the right manner. And then packaging of the tender documents for submission is also important. So I will go through with you how you, you have to do the packaging. And then you will always be, you should always be also be able to comprehend the process and proceed as applicable to evaluation of tenders. And then lastly, understand the process leading to a contract award. So these are the objectives we have set for ourselves. We are hoping that at the end of it all, we'll be able to achieve that. Now, let us, move, let us try and define a tender. But before then, this word tender, Sometimes you know, people use bid or bidding or solicitation. Whatever you see, bidding or solicitation, you know, or proposal, they are all one, but they are used in different uh, types of procurement. Tender is mostly used for uh, procurement of goods and works. When is services, we call it invitation of proposal. So we are trying to define it for everybody to understand. So the definition is that a submission made by a prospective provider, you being the businessman who wants a job, your submission that you are providing in response to an invitation to tender. That means that before you can respond to a tender, there must be an invitation by the employer or the client or the purchaser or whoever it is for the delivery of goods, services, and works. So you, need, you see that you have three types of procurement here, procurement of goods, services, and works. So this tender uh, applies to all of them. We can break it down in four types. The first one is open tender. When we say open tender, then it means it's an invitation that is sent out without the purchaser knowing specific people who are going to respond. So normally this kind of tender is put in the newspaper or on a platform where everybody you know can can respond to so it's open to everybody who meets all the uh, qualification criteria set out in the in the tender now the second one is selective or restricted now if you see selective or restricted tender it is a kind of tender that is uh, limited to a specific people in mind well, what I mean is that uh, that one, you don't put it in a, in a newspaper or a platform, but maybe you look at your tender, uh, what you call database, where you have the kind of supplies you have worked with, and based on your performance, 
you select a few of them that uh, you, you want to invite for that specific assignment. Then we had a third one called negotiated tender. That one is normally uh, refers to a tender where you are dealing with one particular uh, supplier. Maybe an emergency situation, you can go through a competitive process and you want to uh, select one uh, uh, supplier to negotiate with. In some situations, that supplier may be the only supplier uh, around that, 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 that delivers that particular item. You have no other option. And the reason why we call it negotiated is that you, you don't have other quotations or proposals to compare with. So whatever that particular uh, supplier provides, you negotiate and then arrive at a, an agreed you know, terms. The last one is not uh, um, on its own, but depending on the complexity of the pro, uh, procurement, you can decide to have a two-stage tender or a single-stage tender. The single stage is where you look at the tender and then you, 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 you respond to it with all uh, your, your, your uh, prices and all of that. And when the evaluation is done, then the contract is awarded to the winner. But the two stage is where the purchaser doesn't have the capacity to divide, define exactly what he wants. So he puts out the requirements for experts, you know, people who are well versed in it, and then they will uh, come out with, your, with their capabilities and their capacity, their expertise, and all of that. That one, it doesn't come with a price. It's the technical submission. Then the technical submission is evaluated, and then a few of them who qualify technically uh, will be selected. And then from there, they will be asked to submit quotation for what they have submitted. So that is the two stage. Now, having uh, identified the four types, then we will look at the next one. The next one is the eligibility and qualification of tenders. Now, the first thing that as a tenderer or a bidder, you get a bidding document or a tender document the first thing that you need to do is to look at the eligibility and qualification criteria, whether you qualify in terms of technical, economic, or uh, commercial uh, requirements, whether you qualify before you attempt to uh, apply or respond. So some of the uh, qualification criteria differs from one country to another. But globally, uh, the common things we look at are as follows. A company should be legally registered. And a company should also be financially sound. A company is up to, should be up to date on tax payments because public sector you know, government use taxes to procure items, uh, goods and services. You need to pay tax for development before you can participate in government uh, procurement or the uh, um, development, uh, development partners. When they, 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 they get money, is taxpayers' money that they give as a support to a developing countries. So people who want to benefit from that money should be people who pay taxes. So uh, you should be up to date on tax payments. And that person you know, should, or that entity should not be an entity that has been suspended or convicted of any professional misconduct. And you shouldn't have any record of conflict of interest or that particular procurement, if you take part in it, 
Is it going to be seen as a conflict of interest? That one, uh, we look at that. Is, and then you have any other criteria, depending on the country, the particular uh, 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 purchaser, what he wants to add as a qualification criteria. Let's move on, please. Now, the qualification criteria, uh, we look at things like professional and technical qualifications, uh, financial resources, you know, your bank statement, your uh, audited accounts, uh, equipment and other physical facilities, particularly when you are doing works. If you want to construct a road, you know, do you have the necessary equipment, you know, to to, to do the road or the, the project. And then managerial capability and experience in the procurement object. And then the personnel, the key people uh, who are employed by the company to deliver the, the project. Uh, do you have them or you are going to hire them? You look at all of that. Next slide, please. Now, if I say providers, uh, I don't want to restrict to suppliers or contractors or consultants. So I use the word provided to cover all of them. So what I'm saying here is that providers need to provide appropriate documentary evidence for the qualification. So it is not enough to say that, oh, I'm financially sound or uh, I'm a legal entity you need to provide documentary evidence. And these are the documentary evidence that you need to provide. The first one is certificate of incorporation that will tell whether you are a legally registered uh, company, certificate to commerce business, income tax clearance certificate, and then social security clearance certificate. In Ghana, a company, you have to pay the social security of your workers. So the evidence is the clearance certificate, but registration certificate, this applies in Ghana. I don't know, maybe in other countries, this will apply or it will not apply, or you may have something that is not here. So all the things that apply in your country, they will ask in the qualification criteria. Um, audited accounts for a specified period, two years, four years, or five years. Technical capability, production capability for manufacturers and then manufacturer's authorization. Now, production capability you know, is for those who will manufacture and sell directly to purchasers. But if you are a supplier, you don't produce, and you're going to buy the item from a manufacturer, you may need what we call manufacturer's authorization. We will talk about it. It's part of the forms that we use in the uh, tender document. So, that the supplier should be able to provide that, or the provider should be able to provide that. Next. Okay. So now we move on to look at the standard tender documents. Now, the word standard, I want us to look at, uh, I want us to understand. If you say standard, what it means is that that document for the procurement or sourcing is standard everywhere. So if you say standard documents for supply of goods, it should be the same. They have written the documents for you. They will allow a spaces where you put in a specific information about your company. So is a kind of a standardized document that will assure quality of the documentation. So those countries who have uh, procurement laws, these standard documents have been prepared. Uh, development partners like World Bank, African Development, uh, DFID, um, uh, and Danida and all of that, they have their standard documents that you should use. So that is how come we are using the word standard. Now, 
the tender documents govern the relationship between the procuring entity and then the supplier or the contractor during tendering process and contract execution. So you have to have in mind that the tender documents, you know, they have some legal basis. That is why we are very careful about the choice of words and all of that. We don't want to allow individuals to use their own words. So uh, the legal people have prepared the document for us, for us to fill in the specific information. In Ghana, uh, or in government funded procurement, uh, the tender documents must comply with the requirements of Ghana, we have what we call the public procurement access history as amended, you know, by now for 2016. Uh, like I said, development partners like World Bank, ADB, DFID, IFAD, they also have their standard document. So you should know which standard document you are using. Now, standard documents, uh, like I said, seeks to remove diversity and unequal quality of tender documents. So that's what I've explained. So everything is standard. Don't change. In, you know, there, there shouldn't be massive changes in the document when you are filling it. Next. Now, the purpose of the standard tender documents, the main purpose are, one, to instruct tenders on procedures for submission of tenders. So if you read the tender document, is a number of documents put together. So one of them is called instruction to tenders. So they will tell you all the things that you need to do about the submission of the tender. They will describe the goods, give you specifications, and all of that. They also inform you, the bidders or the tenders, of the criteria to be used for evaluation of the tenders and the qualifications that you need to have before you can take part. It also defines the conditions of contracts that will govern the eventual contract and the essence of adding the contracts documents to the tender document is that you need to look at the conditions and the terms of the contract that will apply. If you are not comfortable with it, then you don't need to apply at all. Because responding to tender is an expensive venture. Sometimes you have to buy the tender document if it works, you have to visit the site, do one or two things, they all require money. So you look at the qualification criteria, you look at uh, the contract terms and uh, conditions that will apply. If you are not comfortable with it, then you don't need to even buy the tender document and apply at all. So that is the reason why we attach the contract to it so that you can have the benefit of reading and knowing what will apply eventually. Next, please. Now, we move on to the structure. The, the, the tender document is structured in a special way. When you see the document, you can't put it anywhere in the document. Like I said, there are different documents put together. So they must be logically, you know, packaged. So let's look at how it's structured. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so for purposes of understanding, we have divided them into three parts. And each part have sessions. The part one is the bidding procedure. And then we have the session one on the part one, the document I was talking about. And that one is a very important document because that gives you all the instructions that you need to follow to be able to uh, 
produce a responsive tender. When you understand it, before you attend, please don't uh, go back, please. Now, session two is that the instructions to tender, we don't touch it. You don't, you don't put in anything there. So the session two is provided. And anything that you want to change in the session one is that the, 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 the purchaser wants to change in session one is done in, in, in the session two, which is a specific data that they want to provide. You understand when we go forward. And then the third one is the evaluation and qualification criteria as we've talked about. And then the fourth one is the forms, tender form, the tender form that you will need. Uh, we have the tender form, we have the base security form, we have, you know, they will mention all the forms and they will give you sample of it. If you want to provide it, your bank will have to use the same wording on their uh, letterhead and then produce. The fifth one is not applicable in all situations. It is applicable when you are dealing with um, uh, development partners like UN or uh, World Bank, because some countries are uh, under sanctions. If you have World Bank, you cannot buy from countries that are under UN sanctions. So we have what we call eligible countries. When you are doing international procurement, they will tell you that you cannot buy goods from this particular country because they are under UN sanctions or World Bank sanctions or all of that. So this is for part one. And then the part two is the schedule of requirements. That is the specifications of the goods that you are going to buy, the descriptions. If it is um, works, they will give you bills of quantities. And if it is consultancy, uh, we call it terms of reference that you have to respond to. So that is for part two. And then the part three, like I said, is the general conditions of a contract that will be used and then the special conditions of contract. Uh, if you have opportunity you know, to uh, uh, do contract management in future, I will explain these two uh, uh, in detail. Next, please. Okay, so you are taking the, the documents in the structure one by one. So we look at the instruction to bidders. Like I said, it provides information necessary for tenders to prepare tenders in accordance with the requirements of the purchaser. So these, these things, the, these things that I've listed here and more, they will give you specific instruction on that. They will tell you what makes you eligible or qualified. And then the procedure for clarification. If you want to seek any clarification on the tender, how you go about it. Then the contents of the tender. Then the pricing and currency, they will tell you that, oh, this tender, the quotation must be in your local currency only, or you can quote in dollars, or you can quote in this. So they will specify that. So if they specify that you should quote in uh, local currency and you go and quote in dollars or any other currency, you're, you're qualified. So you are disqualified. So you need to check that. And modification and withdrawals. If you submit a tender, and you want to do modification, how you go about it? If you submit a tender before the deadline, if you want to withdraw it, the procedure, you will find it there. Tender security, if it is 2%, or it should be obtained from a bank or an insurance company, it will also be you know, indicated in, in that document. And then the tender submission and opening procedures, how you should submit the tender and how the tender will be open will also be indicated in that document. The principles of tender examination and evaluation, well, that one too will also be stated in the, in the instruction. And then how the contract will be awarded will also be stated. Next, please. 
So the tender data sheet, that is the, the, the second one. Like I said, you don't change anything in the tender, but the specific information that you need to provide, you, you provide them here. But the quotation must correspond to uh, the, the specific clause you are dealing with in the in the in the uh, in the um, instruction. So these things they will indicate the specific one. For example, applicable rules regarding the tender price and currency. So definitely they will tell you the currency that you should use in quoting your, and they will also indicate the number of copies. This one is specific and they have to indicate in the tender data sheet. Now address, what it means is that if you want to uh, communicate what address you should use or when you want to send the, the tender, submit what address you should put at the back of the envelope. The language, if it is French, you can, they would indicate that you can quote both in French, English, or Portuguese. But sometimes they will say that, okay, this one is only French. You can't quote in English. So if they say it's French only and you quote in, you, you, you submit your tender in, in, in English, then you are disqualified. So they will state the language. And then the amount of the tender security, they will, if they ask you to provide the security, they will ask you maybe 2% of your tender price or uh, maybe a specific amount. And then the tender validity, you know, depending on the economic situation of the country, they can say that your tender can be valid for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or 120 days. But that will depend on the stability of the economy. Of course, if the economy is not stable, you cannot uh, say that your, your tender should be valid for 120 days. Otherwise, you will lose. Uh, next. So we move to the the third uh, one, which is the condition, uh, the, 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 the contract documents that will apply. Now, in every contract, it is like the invitation to tender and the data sheet. The same thing applies to the contract. So they have the general condition of con uh, co uh, contract, that's the GCC. That's why you don't touch it. If you want to change anything, you go to special conditions of contract. So this one to tell you uh, express all the rights and obligation of the parties. So what contract document does that it expresses the rights of the supplier and then the buyer or the, 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 the purchaser. So that's some of the things. There are more things, but these are just a few. Uh, should contain information on the following rights and obligation of both parties. Procedure for measurement, that is if you are doing construction, you, you cannot wait till you finish before they pay you. So maybe monthly or uh, by monthly, you go there, they measure the work you have done, and then they, they price it and payment is done. Uh, you have procedures for alteration. Alteration means, uh, Maybe you want to change the uh, specifications and other things, how you go about it. Uh, price adjustment procedure. If you sign a contract and the contract is going to last for one year, two years, and changes in prices have occurred, how do you go by the adjustment of the prices? Or does the contract allow for adjustment of prices or the fixed price contract? So the contract will talk about all of that. If you need performance security, it will tell you force majeure. I think this is a French word, but in English, uh, we, we define it to mean things, uh, things that are not the fault of the buyer or the seller. It's, it's, it's natural. You know, something natural happens and contract cannot continue how you go about it. So uh, that is force major. 
uh, damages, penalties for delay and all that. Next, please. Yes, Dominique, that's definitely a French word, force majeure. Sorry? I was saying, uh, I'm confirming, it's a definitely a French word, force yes. majeure. Okay, force majeure. That's the uh, uh, right pronunciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Right. Thanks, Dominique. <laughs> now, so when we come to the specific in the special conditions of contract, uh, things like uh, definition of the particular, because the general condition will tell you that you have to define who uh, a purchaser is. So if Ministry of Education is the one purchasing now, it will indicate in the special condition or uh, define the next, uh, uh, special condition that the purchaser of these goods is maybe Ministry of Education. And then the supplier's name will also be uh, defined in the contract. Also, the amount of security you have to indicate in the special. The special will tell you. And then the requirements for insurance. Uh, do you need insurance for this or you don't need insurance? The payment terms, you know, differs from one project to another. So you only have to indicate it in the special conditions. Then the price adjustments, how it should be done, if it is applicable, and other uh, modifications and additions to the general conditions, that one depends, you know, uh, on the parties in the contract. So these are just a few. So if you take a general condition of contract, you see a lot of things there. So you, if you look at the tender document, you see all of these things that you take your time, you go through, you see all the terms and conditions you are talking about. But what you need to understand is that all of these are parts. So don't say that this is a, these are contract documents. So if I'm doing a tender, I don't need to look at it. It's very important you look at it to assure yourself that if you win the contract, you can deliver uh, these uh, um, uh, conditions. Next, please. Now, we have standard forms. I, I mentioned it earlier. There are things that they will ask you to do, maybe tender security, uh, contracts, form, performance security, bank guarantee, manufacturer's authorization. They have designed the form, a sample form. The wording has been indicated in the form. I said from the beginning that everything has to be standard. So they have provided the forms in the tender document. So if you were to uh, um, add the tender security, you have to take that form to your bank. And then they will just write the same, they will just put the wording on their, on their uh, letterhead, and then they will just put in the figures. We don't want them to go and write their own English or own French, because there are legal implications. If you allow people to write their own, you know, they will change things and when things end up in court, the definition will be different, you know, uh, in different courts. So you just pick a form, like um, the price schedule is a form, it's in the, in, the, in the tender document. So don't go and prepare your own uh, form, just use that form, this item. Unit price is this. Um, uh, what do you call it? Total price will be this. CIF price will be this. Uh, this, you know, uh, tax will be that. Then you, you you have to indicate everything in the in the in, using that form because we need consistency and also have a, 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 a standard background to do our evaluation. Bank guarantee. You give it to the bank, and the bank will use the wedding to provide the guarantee for you. Manufacturer's authorization, you have to give them the form, and they will use the wedding 
put it on their letterhead, sign it, and then they will give it to you. So that is the way it is done. Next, please. Now, we've talked about different, different, different documents. Who is responsible for maybe failing what documents? In fact, the tender document is that most of the documents are prepared by the by the supply uh, the, the the purchaser. So the instructions to tender, for instance, that one you don't change it. So it is neither the purchaser nor the 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 supplier who is who is writing it. It's written by maybe World Bank or uh, Ghana Public Procurement Authority or your country's uh, apex body for procurement. So you don't change it, but the tender data sheet, it is the purchaser, the buyer, who will, who will fill it. The special conditions, the buyer is the one who will fill it. The only thing that you will fill, you as a bidder or tenderer will fill, is the price schedule, is the price schedule. Because that one, they will just indicate the items. But you are selling it, so you have to indicate your price and the currency and all of that. So this slide shows us who is responsible for completion of which of the documents. So you can see that the only one that you will fill as a, as a bidder or tenderer is the, is the tender form. The tender form is just like a letter. And that letter is even written for you. So you just indicate your name, your address, and then your, your uh, tender price. You just fill that in and it's complete. So the wedding is standard everywhere. So these are the two things that you will fill. Next, please. Now we move on to how to prepare the tender. Next. Now we have the the I talk I talk about tender form. People also call it tender submission sheet. It's the same thing. It's just like a letter. That one it has been written for you. You only have to indicate your address your reference number and then your tender price and then the price of your your security and all of that so that is it that is for the tender form and then the important thing here that you need to note is that that tender must be signed by an authorized person right from the beginning I told you that tender represents uh, you know, some kind of legal arrangement between supplier and a buyer. So you are committing your company to a buyer. So it should be the person who will sign it is committing the company. So that person should be an authorized person who have the capacity to commit the company. So don't allow anybody at all to sign the, the tender form. It must be signed by an authorized person. Please, it's very, very important. Now the price schedule, like I said from the beginning, you know, it, it provides detailed information regarding the unit prices, the currency to be used, you know, and, and all of that. So that price that you provide, you can side with the list of goods. So they will give you the list of goods in the, in the price schedule. Maybe laptop, uh, table top, uh, uh, fridge, uh, this, that. So you pick laptop, they, they will ask for unit price is this. Quantity is 10. So total, total price will be this, and that price should be uh, maybe um, CIF price, 
So transportation price to this destination you provide. So you do all of that using that form. So you come to the total price of a particular item. And then you do so by with all the items and then you arrive at the total price using that particular form. Okay. So you separate price schedule from goods supply from outside and inside of the purchase. Sometimes uh, the, the form will indicate that, okay, if the items you are going to provide, if you are, you are supplying them from within this country, the form should be this. If it's coming from outside, the form should be different because goods coming from outside, you need to add freight, you need to add uh, insurance, you need to add uh, duties and taxes at the port and all of that. So if all the goods are not coming from within the country, there should be a separate form for you to fill for the goods coming from outside because they are not the same. The, the procedure of pricing is not the same. Then if it's ICT, ICT here is um, uh, international competitive tendering. That means that tendering is open to the whole world. The data enables the purchaser to determine whether the provider is eligible for domestic preference. Now this word domestic preference is, uh, I don't know, it's not used in all countries, but Ghana we use, and I think World Bank also uses. And the, what it does is that, or the rationale behind, is to give some kind of leverage to local suppliers. So if it is international competitive bidding, you can say that if maybe uh, a price of a foreign company is 8% higher than the local supplier, you still go for the local supplier because maybe your country wants to use, because it's your taxpayer's money, and you want to give advantage to local uh, suppliers to get money for the money to remain in the country to provide more jobs for people. People consider this to be a discriminatory thing, but World Bank you know, allows it. Ghana, our public procurement act also allows it. You look at your uh, individual national uh, procurement uh, uh, laws, if they are lied. Simply what it means that it gives advantage, some level of leverage in terms of pricing, so that you can support the local industries to grow. That is the whole idea people will still debate whether it is discriminatory or not discriminatory, but it's still in part of our uh, procurement laws in some of the countries, including Ghana and the World Bank. Next, please. Now, the securities. If you say security, the security is something that guarantees or protects. So if you say, Tender security, then it means you have to provide something to protect your tender. What it means is that if you submit tender and you want to withdraw it, you will pay that money in the security as a compensation to the purchaser. So it's a form of a security to protect your tender. Once you submit, you can withdraw. If you withdraw, there's a punishment there. Now, there's also a performance security. Performance security is a security that protects when you get a contract and you are performing, the 
purchaser wants to put in this that if you don't perform to his or uh, satisfaction then you get you you have to compensate him for for that so that is the security it's normally 10 percent it all depends on the risk associated with that particular supplier if the supplier uh, you have worked with him and he, he performs all the time you can even make it five percent but if the risk is high it can even go beyond 10 percent you know just to protect the, the the purchaser so bank guarantee for advance payment is also in a situation where normally uh, as uh, what do you call it works contract you you may need an advance payment you haven't done any work but by virtue of the fact that you have signed a contract you will need some money to start the contract so the money we will give you in advance that money need to be protected so you have to provide a bank guarantee for that amount so that if you don't do the work the bank that provided the guarantee can pay that money so that is as simple as that now i want you to note something here um if you pick tender security we call it security we can call it tender bond bond because that one insurance companies can provide it performance can also be provided by an insurance so if it's provided by insurance company it's called performance bond but the reason why we are calling the advance yeah. is that one is a guarantee it's not a bond where something will happen insurance have to do investigation no it's like a check the bank will give it if you fail to do the work, the money that has been given to you, the bank that has guaranteed you will have to pay. So once you start the contract and you are submitting your certificate for payment, then that amount will be deducted from your, your certificate to the time that it ends. But if you default, the purchaser can go to the bank and collect that money. So all these securities are normally issued by commercial banks. So that's what I talk about. If it's issued by a bank, then it's called bank guarantee. If it's issued by insurance companies, then it's called bonds. That's why sometimes you can hear insurance uh, uh, performance bond, uh, tender bond, and all of that. Next, please. Okay, so other required documentation. So when you are preparing your tender, other documentation that will, will be required. We talk about all of that. Manufacturer's authorization. All these documents have to be attached to your tender for, before you submit. Qualification information form. Some companies will give you a form that you need to sign and you need to show what makes you qualify for this. Uh -huh. That one you have to add to it. Warranty, if it's good, there is a warranty sheet from the manufacturer. That one you have to add to it. If in some companies, whether goods or whatever, there, you, you can also have some maintenance agreement. It's not part of the tender uh, price. But that particular goods, maybe when you exhaust the warranty period, you may want the, the supplier to give you some preventive service for a period. Because it's outside the contract after warranty, we call it maintenance agreement. That agreement, some suppliers or some uh, purchases wants to have a look at it so that you know they will know when their warranty is finished quick how that relationship is going to be how you are going to maintain their things for them if that one too is not good it can also cost your 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 selection as a successful bidder 
Now, the manufacturer's authorization, I've talked about this, uh, letterhead of manufacturer, you know, signed by a person with proper uh, authorization. Hello? Uh huh. Boga. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Yes, sorry, uh, okay. I, I had an issue with uh, yes. Okay. Sorry, I, I I had an issue with the internet. Okay. So, so I'm back. All right. I was I was I was wondering. Okay. Right. You you, you yes. were there. Uh, yes. 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 You are there. Okay. Thanks. Now, um, some. Tenders allow for joint ventureship. Joint ventureship is a situation where maybe you look at the tender document and you can see that you as a supplier, you cannot deliver everything. So you want to join hands with another company so that you can submit one tender to make your your case solid you can come together as a joint venture and then you submit a bid but that has to be indicated there is there is a, a clause in the in the invitation uh, the instruction to bidders how you go about settings so you need to follow if you want to do that you need to follow that instructions and then the kind of agreement between the two of you, what percentage this company is performing, what percentage this is, who is the lead, and who is the, all of that, you can find it in the instruction. Now the warranty I've talked about it is for equipment or plant. And then the sample maintenance agreement, I've talked about it. So other documents that you can add, I talked about it earlier to confirm your qualification and your your um, um, your qualification, audited accounts, VAT certificates, NIST grants, labor department certificates, certificate of incorporation, and all of that. So if they ask for all of that, you need to attach them to your tender documents. Because well, these are the documentary evidence to show that you qualify. Next, please. Next. Uh -huh. Now, the technical requirements is basically uh, the description of the items, the serial numbers, the quantity, the delivery schedule, and all of that. Now, you can see what we call INCO terms. These INCO terms are used when you are buying from outside your country. The INCO terms are international commercial terms. So it determines the responsibilities of the, the buyer and then the seller, where the goods will come from, what type of delivery, are they delivering to the port or delivering to your, your uh, last destination, 
So if it is S works, it's a different thing altogether. We need to go back F O B C I P C I F. They all have a different definition. So if the goods are coming from outside, are they coming by C? Are you using C I F? Where is the destination for for the purchaser to pick the goods? It, it has to be defined by these inco terms. So the right inco term must be must be used. Now, when it comes to uh, the technical specification, you know, it's just the description of the item technically. You know, if it is uh, a computer, the 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 uh, what do you call it? The capacity. This that that you have to indicate all of that. Now. Uh, scope of works and bill of quantities normally for works. And like I said from the beginning, um, terms, terms of reference is also for consultancy services. Next, please. Right. Now we move to the tender submission and opening. How you should package your things. So the how to put the documents together, all the documents that you have to add, that's what we have done. So now you've gotten to the point where you have to put them in an envelope and submit. So this is the way we go about it. Envelopes containing the original and the copies shall be enclosed in one single envelope. So if they ask you to submit maybe one original, four copies, you put the one original in one envelope, and then the four copies, you put all of them in one envelope. And then you pick one big envelope, and then you put all these envelopes in them. So the copies, you indicate copies, at the back, and then you put address. The reason why you should put address in the inner envelopes are that sometimes when they are doing the opening, the documents can mess up and you can't find who it belongs to. So when they open the big envelope, which has the address of the purchaser, the inner envelope should also have the reference numbers and the addresses so that if one gets missing, you can find them. So they can easily count the number of copies that they ask you to, to submit. And then they will also know which one is the, the original. So you have to do it that way. So uh, the inner and outer envelope shall bear the name and address of the provider. That means you, the one sending it, your address has to be in the front. And then the address of the purchaser should also be at the back, like you are sending a letter to somebody. Now, depending on the nature of the tender, if it is national competitive bidding, uh, this one in relation to World Bank and, and uh, maybe Ghana procurement law, if it is national competitive bidding, what that means is that if it is open to everybody in the country or is open to the world, the opening has to be public. That means those who submitted, they have to be present before you open. But if it's restricted tendering, you know, it is not compulsory for public opening. Okay. So we need to we need to understand understand that. So if it is national competitive bidding, the opening shall be public. Those who submitted have to be present. And then when you are calling uh, this, this is for uh, this purchaser. He, sub he submitted four copies, one original. The price he quoted and the security he provided. So they will be recording all of that. So that at the end of the day, everybody will know how much each beta or tendra uh, quoted and all of that. So that is how the opening should be done. 
they had to be in public. And after that, uh, after the opening, those present can also ask questions for clarification and all of that. Yes. Uh, next, please. So, like I said, the purchaser shall prepare a record of the tender opening that shall include as a minimum the name of the provider and whether there is a withdrawal, substitution, or modification. The tender price per lot, if applicable, including any discount and alternative offers. The presence or absence of a tender security, if one was required. The prov provider's representatives who are present shall be requested to sign the record sheet. So the record, a copy of that record sheet, you know, can be given to uh, those who need it. Next, please. Now, quickly, let's move to the evaluation uh, bit, and then we can end. Uh, Move on, please. Next. Okay. So I think I can summarize the evaluation. Now, the way the this one, you you the bidder, you will not be there. But as a procurement expert, I'm going to show you how evaluation is done, so that if uh, you 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 are tender goes through evaluation and you win or you don't win, you know how it's done. Now, we have three, we do the evaluation at three levels. Three levels. The first one is what we call preliminary examination or the eligibility examination. That one you, they just examine the documents. You know, it's a, it's a first step. All the things, the qualification criteria, eligibility criteria, the things that they ask you to submit, your task runs, your uh, legal registration document and all that, they check those things, whether the tender is signed or not. So this is the preliminary. So if they see that you did not sign your tender, or you did not provide any of the documents requested, your document is, is disqualified. So you will not move to the next stage of the, of, the, of the evaluation. So it doesn't matter whether your price is the best. That is why I said from the beginning that the instruction to be this and all the things that you need to provide, you need to look at them critically. Make sure you have everything before you attempt to respond to a tender. Because a small thing can disqualify you and your technical and uh, financial will not be will look at at all. So the thing that we look at is, uh, has the tender been correctly signed? If they cancel something or they erase something, have they initialed it? The tender security has been submitted. Do you have manufacturer's authorization? The correct, correct numbers have been submitted. You know, you have provided your task credits and all of that. So these are the things that they look at. If you fail in one of them, they, they, can, they can disqualify you. Next. Now, when your tender is being um, evaluated, we have two types of um, deviations. We have minor deviations and material deviations. And that determines whether you are responsive or non-responsive. Now, minor deviations are Small, small deviations that does not affect the, the 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 core the core of the of the of the items that that is requested. 
For example, uh, if I ask you to provide a car and I ask you to provide maybe white color, a white color, and maybe you don't have white, you you said your your car is the same car, but your car is brown. You know, the color is considered as a minor deviation because the color does not affect the performance of the car. Anything that affects the performance of the car is the engine capacity, you know, those uh, material things that can change how the the thing will perform. So when we look at that, and you see minor deviation, or it is a major or material deviation, that determines whether they should throw your thing away, or they can consider it as manner and then move on to uh, evaluate further. Next, please. Now the commercial evaluation, if you are able to go through the, the, the eligibility or the preliminary, then we move on to the commercial. The commercial are small, small things like delivery. For example, maybe they, they said, okay, they want the item to be delivered in 30 days. And then the payment terms, say maybe uh, payment, 30 days after delivery. Now, somebody can say that, no, uh, you have to pay him 10 days, 10 days after delivery. So the one doing the evaluation, commercially, if he's paying 30 days after delivery, and you are asking for 10 days after delivery, commercially, you go in for the one giving him 30 days. That is uh, commercially advantageous to, to him. And then the things like uh, the validity of your, of your tender. If you say, oh, your tender is valid for, for 10 days. Somebody says his tender is valid for 120 days. That one will also have advantage over you. So these are the commercial terms. Somebody will say that, okay, um, my warranty is two years. If you are providing the same thing and your warranty is one year, commercially, the other one is more advantageous. So these are the, the responsibility. So sometimes they, they indicate, they indicate the delivery. If it is 20 days and you said 20 days, you have qualified. Unless you state 30 days, then you, you have quoted higher than what they are asking for. So you have to fall within what they are asking for. Next, please. Now, the technical is the most important thing, I would say, because that is where the uh, most of the material deviations come from. You know, because the technical people, they have actually prepared the, 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 uh, the Technic, the, the technical requirements because it can perform a specific operation in the organization that they want. So if you are not able to provide that, then it cannot do what they want the item to do for them. So technically, that is where you say you are responsive or you are not responsive. And that one, if uh, they are asking for uh, two, five, six capacity for the computer and you give them, uh, uh, I don't know, one, five, zero, you are out. If the engine capacity for the vehicle, they are saying uh, 2.0 and you are giving them 1.5, you are disqualified because the vehicle is coming to perform a specific operation for the organization and is 2.0 and above that can do. So your 1.5 cannot do it. Next, please.
Next, please. Yes, I've, I have explained the minor and the major deviations, the material deviations. Then move on. Uh -huh. uh, now, we've done the commercial, you have done the preliminary, the way they do the preliminary uh, examination, the commercial evaluation, and then uh, the technical evaluation. The last one is the, the price evaluation. They look at the prices. But before you compare the prices, first of all, you do what we call, you have to examine the prices, maybe uh, the unit price, and then the quantity, you have to multiply and make sure that everything, the arithmetic uh, and everything is correct. You have to do the calculation. So if maybe they made a mistake, they give you a unit price. But when they are multiplying it to the quantity, uh, they give you a wrong figure. That is a, a minor deviation. In evaluation, once the unit and you multiply it by quantity, and there's a mistake. It's a, we call it arithmetic error. So you have to write it to them for them to confirm the correct uh, figure. So you do the corrections and make sure everything is OK before you can compare whose price is the best and which one is not the best. Now, let me add this. Uh, in arriving at the, the successful bidder, Ghana, we have what we call the lowest evaluated bidder. Lowest evaluated bidder. This lowest evaluated bidder is different from the lowest bidder. The evaluation process that we've gone through, those who fail from the beginning, they, they, they will be disqualified. So it's only those who go through the preliminary the commercial, the uh, technical, and they arrive at the price, the one with the lowest price, because they qualify in all areas, you pick them. You pick them as the winners. That is what applies in Ghana. But because I'm involved in uh, EU and other, other areas, in EU, EU, for instance, they focus on what they call uh, most advantageous, uh, the most advantageous tender. That one, they will look at the commercial things. OK, this one, even though the price is, is um, uh, lower, but they are giving me three year warranty and you are giving me one year. They will do some kind of analysis and know that commercially, they are the most advantageous. So uh, their law allows them to pick the, the most advantageous tenders and not the lowest uh, beta as we do in Ghana. But Ghana now, we are also moving to the lowest uh, at this thing. So, that is the case. I don't know what pertains in your country, but Ghana, you are even trying to move to the most advantageous uh, tenders and all of that. Next, please. Next. So these are uh, the, all the things that we do when we are, we, are, we are checking the prices. Sometimes if the, uh, the tender allows for people to Coach in different currencies. During the evaluation, you have to convert all the currencies into one currency before you can do the comparison. So that is the currency conversion there. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, so that's the price comparison. Now, the contract award, once all of this has been done, and uh, a winner has been selected, 
then you do these things. Uh, so quickly, I think uh, we need to move on. So, uh, so you you notify uh, the one who has won. Yeah, that is the notification. You don't give them the contrast straight. You notify them, and then uh, everything that they will do the contract. Then you notify the unsuccessful ones. If nobody comes out with a complaint or, or the, then you move on to contract. But in Ghana, our law provides that those who are not successful, they have the right, you know, to be informed what made them unsuccessful. So you can come to you for the for explanation and you have to provide that. So that is it. Let's move on, please. So uh, gradually we are coming to the end. The summary, uh, we, are, we are saying that uh, when you are doing a tender, you need to follow the, we all have to follow the uh, procedures properly so that we can all enhance the integrity of the procurement process. We can also promote ethical behavior. Don't go and attempt a bribe attempt to bribe a, a, a purchaser to get a contract. You know, it doesn't help. And then we all have to, uh, the rules may be complex, but you have to seek advice and act properly and openly. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, so now we come to the end of the presentation. Uh, we can go through to see whether we have achieved our our listing. Uh, now time is right for questions. Boka? Yes. yes. Okay. We, Thank you. We can Thank divide you. questions now. Yes. Thank you very much um, indeed for this very uh, complete presentation. Uh, there was no properly uh, questions in the in, in the chat box, but. Uh, we we uh, we uh, we exceed the, the time, so I guess uh, I guess we can just uh, we can just get back on the summary, which is the key takeaway that you can give uh, to the uh, to the to the audience. What should they take away? Uh, as uh, as as a conclusion of um, of this uh, webinar, please. Dominic. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I was can asking. Hear you. I, I, I was asking what the key takeaway that you should uh, recommend for our audience. As a conclusion, the key takeaway. Mm -hmm. Yes, what I would advise is that the procurement process, you know, is governed by rules. Mm -hmm. And if you want to mm -hmm. win contracts, just uh, follow the rules mm -hmm. and then uh, try and win, you know, on fair grounds. Don't try and use uh, unethical means to win contracts. That one, you know, uh, national laws will not allow it. International laws will not allow it. And it doesn't um, go well for, our, especially our, our part of the world, Africa, where, you know, corruption, is the order of the day. We all have to ensure integrity in our procurement process so that if you win a procurement, everybody will know that you win it on a fair ground. If I win, everybody will know that I competed well and I won you know, appropriately. 
we all have to contribute because the procurement people cannot do it alone. If you, the one seeking contracts, don't pay the price, others will not accept it. Not everybody will be able to uh, resist bribes. So let's all try and observe this um, this 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 kind of uh, procedures. Try and adhere to them, and then we do things properly for our national development. So that is what I. Can yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Um, that's just basically what I've needed uh, to uh, to conclude because ethics is very key and um, complying with the standards, with international standards, it's something very, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something at, at most in, important, if I, can, if I can say, it's very critical uh, to follow the rules, uh, anti-bribery and corruption, anti-slavery, this kind of ethics, it's key, it's key, it's key. And uh, we had such a, uh, an important webinar last week about these topics. We had also another one this week regarding uh, environment, social and governance. So it's all based on uh, being fair and uh, uh, get the opportunity that you deserve. So as a closing remark, what I can say is that creating a level playing field for local SMEs Seeks to fill, seeks to fill a, wide, a widening communication gap to make the efforts to better understand tendering processes, avoiding inertia, uh, avoiding <clears throat> leaving contracts in the hand of the same old group of suppliers who understand the unwritten rules of how to work with MNCs or top companies. Meanwhile, ambitious SMEs with untapped potential must comply by inflexible processes and realistic expectations. So, in a, world, in a world we are happy to contribute to supporting capacity and capability in local content strategy and operational effectiveness in Mauritania and Senegal, just like this event has tangibly demonstrated it. Please, feedback on us. Uh, if you want more sessions like this, and uh, many, many thanks for your great attention. Again, congratulations for joining us. You were more than, th uh, more than 30 persons. Thanks a lot, Dominique, for taking time to uh, reveal the, the, the tender processes and um, the importance of following the rule and the process. And please feel free to go to investinafrica.com and appmauritania.com as well as APP Senegal to register with us and find out more about our programs and future events, webinar, or workshops. Thank you very much again, Dominique. Thanks for your great work, and thanks for the audience for being so interested by by these uh, by these topics. Thank you. Enjoy your evening, and talk to you very soon. Bye bye. Take care. Luca, Luca. Yes, yes, Dominique. Yeah, uh, just to say that uh, all the forms I talk about, I have sample, so I'll send them to you, and then you can uh, share with. Uh, participants so that they they can feel and see the the the, the things themselves you know actually, it's almost the same I, everywhere okay actually i already shared it widely i already disseminated to all the participants and we also disseminated with the recording of this event and we are we're also trying to um translate uh this this recording into french for uh, to enlarge our our audience too, so yeah, that, that's it's good. a very good idea. It's a very good idea. Thanks for that, Dominic. That's good. That's good. Thank you very much for your okay. and uh, and and Dominic. You, you promise next time you will pronounce first major in French. Yes, <laughs> first first <laughs> major. First major. I'm very I'm very. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Au revoir. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Dominique. Au revoir. Uh, bye. Bye bye.